Good morning. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Agricultural Policy, Economics, and Diverse Farms and Farmers Virtual Conference hosted by Farm Foundation and the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Economic Research Service. My name is Martha King, and I am the Vice President of Programs and Projects at Farm Foundation. We are proud to partner with the Economic Research Service to bring this event to you, and we are excited that you are all joining us over the next two days. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about Farm Foundation and ERS before we get started today. Farm Foundation is an accelerator of practical solutions for agriculture, whose mission is to build trust and understanding at the intersections of agriculture and society. Since 1933, Farm Foundation has been connecting leaders across the food and agriculture sectors, including farming, business, academia, nonprofit and industry organizations, and government. With a vision to build a future for farmers, our communities, and our world, Farm Foundation seeks to accelerate people and ideas into action. The Economic Research Service is USDA's principal social science research agency. The mission of ERS is to anticipate trends and emerging issues in agriculture, food, the environment, and rural America, and to conduct high quality objective economic research to inform and enhance public and private decision making. ERS research provides context for and informs the decisions that affect the agricultural sector, which in turn enables efficient stewardship of agricultural resources and the sector's economic prosperity. As we get underway with the conference, here are a few logistical things to keep in mind. The event hub is your starting point for all sessions. Log in each day using your event link, the same one you used to get here today. You will need to individually join each session that you want to attend. The link for the Remo Networking Lounge is available during our afternoon break, is also available in your event hub. Please note that the virtual lounge can be accessed with a phone, desktop, or laptop only, not a tablet. You may have noticed a delay in the video starting this morning. For all sessions, you may need to refresh your web page to start the live stream on your device. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen Morgan, Research Agricultural Economist with the International Trade and Development Branch in the Market and Trade Economics Division of the USDA Economic Research Service. Stephen? Uh, thank you, Martha. Um, and thank you and welcome to everybody who's attending this morning. Um, so I just want to quickly speak to why are we holding this conference? It's part of a joint effort between the Farm Foundation and ERS to promote discussion about how the design, the implementation, and the evaluation of agricultural policy serves a diverse landscape of farms and farmers in the US, all of whom face different opportunities and challenges. Farm operations vary across key characteristics, including the commodities they produce, farm size, geography, and soil characteristics, among many others. At the same time, Farmers themselves are as diverse as the farms they operate. Farmers vary across multiple, multiple dimensions, including but not limited to educational background, race, ethnicity, gender, farming experience, and income levels. There's a critical need to better understand how the diversity of America's farms and farm operators interact to affect engagement with and outcomes from agricultural policy. The research presentations that were submitted for this conference span a broad range of topics, and reflect several different empirical approaches to research at the intersection of economics, policy, and diversity in agriculture. Today's research presentations are going to be centered around two different topics. In the first two sessions of today, um, we will focus on participation in and access to a wide variety of government programs. Later today, there will be a third session that will have several different research presentations that are situated at the nexus of environmental economics and diverse farms and farmers. So once again, we would like to thank you all for your interest and for attending today's conference. I'll be moderating the research sessions. So as Martha mentioned earlier, please feel free to submit your questions via the attendee interface. Uh, and with that, I'm now excited to introduce our first opening speaker for the conference, Dr. Dwayne Goldman. Dr. Goldman is the inaugural senior advisor for racial justice and equity at the USDA, where he serves as a key advisor to the Secretary of Agriculture. In this presidential appointment, Dr. Goldman routinely works with White House personnel on designing, planning, and executing key initiatives and priorities, while also representing the Secretary and USDA on high-level working groups and public-facing forums. He provides leadership on the implementation of congressional initiatives and on cross-departmental racial equity work. Prior to joining the USDA, Dr. Goldman spent 25 years in the agricultural, chemical, and seed industry. Dr. Goldman worked at the Monsanto Company, later acquired by Bayer Crop Sciences in technology development, with a particular focus on Southern row crops. 
as well as working as part of the government affairs team and human resources. In 2020, Dr. Goldman served as the executive director of the National Black Growers Council, an organization he was instrumental in creating and advised for over 10 years. Dr. Goldman has served on numerous advisory boards, including for organizations such as Manners, the Policy Center for Socially Disadvantaged Farmers and Ranchers, the Southern Risk Management Education Center, and multiple terms on the USDA's Advisory Committee for Minority Farmers and Ranchers. Dr. Goldman received his bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Arkansas and his PhD from Iowa State University in Agronomy. He also farms in Southeast Arkansas where he produces corn, rice, and soybeans. So once again, thank you for joining this morning and Dr. Goldman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. Good morning. I hope you all can hear me. I am uh, battling what I hope is the end of some kind of bug that's trying to take me out, but uh, I'm fighting it. Uh, uh, so I, I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll try and keep my volume up so you can hear me. Uh, I want to thank Farm Foundation for partnering with ERS, uh, in, in particular Farm Foundation uh, for for doing this work since February of 1933, tackling major issues in agriculture through a, through a broad range of expertise, as has been mentioned, including academia, industry, producers, a good cross section across the board. I want to extend a special thanks to your president and CEO, Sherry Rogue Fiddler, for her expertise and valuable contributions to uh, getting the Equity Commission to a spot where they can, where they actually provided a set of final recommendations from her position on the Ag Subcommittee. Very valuable contributions. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, but again, thanks for the opportunity to address this crowd. I looked at the I looked at the agenda. And I'm glad to see you talking about these things that are near and dear to American agriculture. Ag policy, economics, and diverse farms and farmers. As we've heard many times before, we've had certain pivotal points in US agriculture where uh, the decision was made to really focus on farm efficiency, actually standing up larger farms, uh, which resulted in fewer farms and, and actually left out a lot of small and middle-sized farms. We've been challenged to consider a system where we focus on all producers and look at ways that we can gain additional value from new opportunities, such as investments in climate smart agriculture, renewable energy, ecosystem service markets, domestic fertilizer innovation, and really creating those renewable food systems that actually turn a dollar more times in these rural communities, uh, which, which drives a more vibrant agricultural economy. Opportunities around farm generated energy, carbon sequestration markets, local and regional food systems that really build on uh, rural agriculture and uh, gives people the opportunity to participate in alternative processing, more procurement opportunities, and new opportunities such as those presented by organic production. We're seeing now where the those moments in history where we've been told to get big or get out, it doesn't necessarily work for everyone. The underlying premise is that everyone has equal access to resources and tools and opportunities. And as we've seen, that's not quite the case. And so when you have a fence row to fence row mandate, certain people are not able to access uh, those opportunities, we find ourselves with disparities. And when ERS published data that showed that 7.5% of our farms received 89% of the income, that's a reflection of people not having access to these opportunities. As you heard from my bio, I'm an agronomist, not necessarily a mathematician, but if 7.5% gets 89% of the income, that leaves the other 92.5% to fight over the remaining 11%. And so we find ourselves with systems that are disparate and we find ourselves in a situation where we have to do better and, and actually transform farms to where more income can be generated on the farm and farm incomes become a, becomes a more vibrant part of rural America. We tackle this work uh, from the outset of this administration. This was a very important factor in our equity work because a big part of it was actually digging through the data and recognizing those things that led to these disparities. 
about two weeks ago, the Equity Commission, as I stated, delivered its final report. We'll spend uh, the, 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 the rest of this administration trying to implement those recommendations, trying to prioritize and implement those 66 recommendations that lead to a more equitable USDA. The Equity Commission is an important part of the equity work that's ongoing here at the, at the department. A large part of this has to be uh, an effort to make sure that USDA is reflective of the diverse American population that is bound to serve. That's the diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility work that has to make sure that we are tapping into diverse sources of talent to make sure that we can access that talent and bring them in so that people will have the opportunity to do business with folks that they are comfortable with. There's also programmatic equity that goes along with the Equity Commission. Programmatic equity meaning taking a, a hard look at farm policies and procedures and really trying to figure out where those have resulted in missed opportunities, and how we modify those to be more inclusive. Again, I think the Equity Commission has done a great job of getting some recommendations to the secretary that we could implement. I thought I would spend a few minutes talking about those recommendations. Now, there, there's 66 of them. So no, I'm not gonna go through and read 66 recommendations to you in the last three or four minutes that I have. I thought what I would do would be to try and kind of frame those up that you'd have a better understanding of the work ahead and perhaps even how you might work with the department to make sure that we get those recommendations prioritized and implemented to the extent that that's possible. So there were recommendations dealing with making equity a more permanent part of USDA, ways to institutionalize equity, elevating the Office of Tribal Relations, increasing language access uh, in places where that's needed. There were four or five recommendations around making equity more permanent. There's continued recommendations on making sure that we measure, audit, and instill accountability into the implementation of these recommendations. A lot of effort has been underway in making sure that our Office of Civil Rights is properly resourced so that they can operate more efficiently and respond to customers' needs when something falls through the crack. There were about four or five recommendations that dealt with how we engage with the public, how we invest in private-public partnerships, how we increase procurement opportunities, how we do strategic outreach to make sure that we are gaining uh, participation and getting input from those folks who have traditionally been left out of a lot of our programs. As you know, in agriculture, and one of your strong uh, tenants at the Farm Foundation has been land access. And there's a couple of recommendations that deals with land access. And it's not just dealing with land access as much as it is looking at some prior um, situations that have kept certain people from having equitable access to land. The Native American community is called fractionated land. The Black farming community, it can be heirs property where uh, land is, is transferred from one generation to the next without clear guidance as to how that should be done. And there's some unique program and unique recommendations around that. As I mentioned, uh, we, we are at a at, at kind of a crossroads. Things like climate smart agriculture and investing in opportunities that give people a chance to um, participate in additional forms of income, like cost share improvements. Um, those recommendations revolve around conservation. It's not just conservation, but we need to improve how our customers respond to those notices, making sure that we are reaching out and reach it, providing the kind of technical assistance and outreach through trusted cooperators that give people better access to loans, grants, and also dealing with some missed opportunities in the past. Missed opportunities around fairness in uh, base acre uh, calculations, fairness in representation on county committees. Uh, these recommendations are intended to, again, address prior inadequacies and make sure that uh, the department is responsive to the needs of all of our customers. There's a lot of recommendations dealing with farm workers. In this equity commission convening, farm workers really rose to the top as an issue that needed uh, addressing. And, and the emphasis is to make sure that those farm worker recommendations actually reach the intended participants, making sure that they have access to 
safety, nutrition, nutritious food programs, and the like to make sure that that continued resource uh, is properly um, managed so that we can continue their role in American agriculture. There's programs around strengthening extension and research programs, particularly around minority serving institutions, as well as SNAP, thrifty food plans, in making sure that more of our population has access to a healthy and safe uh, food system. We stood up the Rural Community and Economic Development Subcommittee, and it was interesting to see them catch up to the other uh, ag subcommittee and actually deliver about 25 recommendations that dealt with how rural development programs should be administered. Things around broadband, things around housing, uh, opportunities around environmental justice. We, we are anxious to work with the Equity Commission as we continue to implement those recommendations. In addition to that, as I close, I, I want to say that the Equity Commission is one of uh, one of several one of one of several efforts that has to be done cooperatively in order to to let us deliver on this, and we look forward to continued partnerships with our, with organizations such as the Farm Foundation to make sure that we deliver on these. So I wish you the best over your conference in the, in the next coming days. And I look forward to future interactions with you. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. Thank you, Dr. Goldman. Uh, we all definitely appreciate your time and your remarks this morning, and thank you for taking the time to highlight the work and the recommendations of the Equity Committee. Um, our second speaker that I would like to introduce is Dr. Antonio McLaren. Uh, Dr. McLaren is the Vice President for Programs of the 1890 Universities Foundation. In this role, he manages high-impact programs and initiatives across the 1890 land-grant institutions to help them respond to new and emerging opportunities and challenges. Prior to his current position, Dr. McLaren uh, worked for USDA's National Institute of Food and Agriculture as a national program leader for NIFA's 1890s programs portfolio. Dr. McLaren also worked for the USDA's Office of Advocacy and Outreach as the USDA 1890 liaison at Virginia State University. Dr. McLaren has over 22 years of federal service, all with the USDA. Uh, Dr. McLaren was selected as a USDA 1890 national scholar he earned his bachelor's degree in agricultural business and economics and his master's degree in economics and finance at Virginia State University. Dr. McLaren received his doctorate degree in education, le educational leadership at Virginia Commonwealth University. So thank you again, Dr. McLaren, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Morgan, and good morning to all of you. It is a pleasure to speak with you this morning. I just want to say thank you to both the Farm Foundation and USDA's Economic Research Service for hosting this very important conference. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I do have a, just a, a few slides I'd like to share to kind of give you some color to some of the perspectives I'll be sharing. Okay, hopefully you should be able to see my screen. And yes. I'll go ahead and just get started. So um, I'm gonna just kind of give you some awareness about who we are at the 1890 Universities Foundation. For those of you who are not aware, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization established in December of 2016 uh, to really do two things. One is to mobilize resources and facilitate implementation of collaborative higher impact programs. And an example of that are the 1890 Centers of Excellence, six of those uh, that were established via the 2018 Farm Bill. And then the second one is to foster critical collaborative projects across the 1890 universities to discover practical and meaningful solutions to the compelling economic, social, environmental challenges faced by our communities. Um, key stakeholders are the 1890 presidents, deans, extension administrators, and research directors. And we're also co-located with the Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities, also known as APLU in Washington, DC. So when I say 1890 Universities Foundation, I wanna just have the map as a visual, we are representing 19, 1890 land grant institutions located in 18 states, and, and these are the institutions um, in front of you. I'm gonna now narrow down on one of those in institutions, uh, Tuskegee University. I know Dr. Sean Gay is on the panel. I'm not gonna talk too much about uh, the Center of Excellence because I know he'll cover it, but I do wanna highlight the fact that we have six centers of excellence, one of which is uh, housed at Tuskegee University, focusing on farming systems, rural prosperity, 
and economic sustainability. And really what this center is, is meant to do is to develop and share best practices, innovations, and technologies um, and personnel across an 18 state region to address the profitability, sustainability, and prosperity uh, to address challenges faced by small farmers, ranchers, and forest land owners. Also, I'm gonna highlight a key partnership um, that really is brought in the private sector. Uh, and essentially, the Center of Excellence at Tuskegee has been partnering with Microsoft, uh, where the center is really making headway on its mission to develop and share best practices, innovations, and technologies. Um, by partnering with Microsoft to get a boost from Microsoft's Farm Vibes Digital Agricultural Tools. Um, so in this, in this uh, example, we have Microsoft scientists have actually been on site at Tuskegee University, collaborating with the center to apply digital technologies to combat the effects of climate change. And this is really building on Microsoft's Farm Beats research, where agriculture researchers are creating and applying tools to advance precision agriculture strategies to help drive the adoption of sustainable practices in the small farm environment. So I definitely want to recognize the work that Tuskegee is doing, as well as the partnership with Microsoft. On my next slide, I, I can't, you know, we can't talk about the work that the 1890s are doing uh, to affect uh, the lives of small farmers and, and others without really mentioning uh, who's actually doing the work. And a lot of this work is being done on behalf of 1890 Extension. I mentioned that one of our key stakeholders are the 1890 Extension Administrators. So I do want to recognize the work being done by the Association of 1890 Extension Administrators. Uh, and I want to highlight that the 1890 Cooperative Extension System assists diverse audiences with an emphasis on those who have limited social and economic resources to improve the quality of life and vitality of individuals and communities through transformational engagement and outreach education. Uh, and this is actually what you're looking at is the front cover of the 2023 impact report. So certainly for more information about 1890 Extension, please visit the, their website at 1890aea.org. And I also want to just recognize and thank Dr. Goldman for his, his, his comments this morning, um, because I, I also wanted to highlight just two of the recommendations that came out of the um, Equity Commission uh, final report. I also want to uh, also pause and, and just kind of give you greetings on behalf of our new president and CEO of the 1890 Universities Foundation, Dr. Jewel Bernal. Uh, Dr. Jewel Bernal started in her role in January of this year, January 1st to be exact. And during her time as Deputy Secretary at USDA, she worked with Secretary Vilsack to start the Equity Commission to build a more equitable and fair future for everyone who participates in agriculture. So I do wanna nail down two key recommendations that were in that report, because I think it really speaks to the discussion that we're gonna have here over the next couple of days. Um, one recommendation is uh, with actually specifically recommendation 29, calls for increased funding and support to expand cooperative extension service programming to marginalize communities through cooperative agreements and more descriptive language in RFAs for competitive funding to facilitate collaboration with minority ag colleges and universities. So this is where I really should emphasize and must emphasize the work of the Centers of Excellence, but specifically the work that Tuskegee University is doing to lead its Center of Excellence in Farming Systems, Rural Prosperity and Economic Sustainability. Uh, the center really provides an opportunity to showcase why the 1890s are uniquely positioned to address the needs of small and underserved producers. So this is a very key recommendation. Additionally, I, I wanna highlight recommendation 28, which calls for the need to make matching requirements consistent across institutions and address the 1890 inequities in funding. So federal research and extension dollars, including their state match provide foundational support to address food and agricultural priorities across the 18 line, sorry, the 1890 land grant university system. So this is very critical because without the, the state match, it really hampers the capacity by which 1890 institutions are able to deliver uh, extension 
resources and tools to communities that they serve. So for those of you who are in 1890 states, for those of you who can advocate, I invite you uh, to advocate on behalf of your 1890 institutions, speak to the, to the resources or to the tools that maybe you've personally received or perhaps observed the 1890s in doing their work, continue to advocate for the good work that they're doing because that advocacy is so critical in ensuring that not only that they're getting their federal dollars, but they're getting their state match. I also wanna highlight at this point, some of you might've recall uh, APLU did a policy brief back in 2013. Uh, it was a policy research brief that really discussed the unequal state one-to-one -one match funding for 1890 land-grant institutions. And here we are in 2024, we are still talking about uh, the importance of the state match. So this is a discussion that's been ongoing and persistent. So we need to be just as persistent with respect to our advocacy efforts to address the inequities. And I will close here um, just with a couple of links. For those of you who want to get in touch with me directly, you can certainly email me. Uh, the 1890 Foundation website is available as well. And I can be found, as well as the 1890 Foundation can be found on LinkedIn. Jewel Bernal is also on LinkedIn if you want to connect with her. We look forward to working with all of you and advancing this discussion. And certainly we look forward to Farm Foundation and, and ERS continuing this dialogue even after the conclusion of this conference. Thank you again. I appreciate your attention. I yield back to Dr. Morgan. Thank you, Dr. McLaren, and thank you for taking the time to highlight the important work that the 1890s universities and the 1890s cooperative extension services uh, do to serve rural communities and producers uh, in the U.S. Um, now, I would like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Raymond Shange. Dr. Shange is the 1890 Extension Administrator, uh, Director of the Carver Integrative Sustainability Center, and Associate Dean of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences in the College of Agriculture, Environment, and Nutrition Sciences at Tuskegee University. In his administrator and director role, he provides daily oversight of applied research, extension, and student experiential learning programs in the Alabama Black Belt and beyond. Programs of note that he has contributed to include Climate Smart Agriculture, Urban Agriculture and Food Systems, and Future Farmers and Agricultural Specialist Programs. Dr. Shange has degrees in Biosciences and Philosophy and directs his professional interest towards sustainable development with tools and strategies for natural resource management and regeneration in limited resource contexts. He serves as the Vice Chair of the Environmental Protection Agency's Farm, Ranch, and Rural Communities Committee, Chair of the Professional Development Committee, and Member of the Executive Committee of the Southern Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program, and Board Chair for the Southern Rural Development Center, as well as serving on the boards for Agricultural Missions Incorporated and the Council on Food, Agriculture, and Resource Economics. Uh, Dr. Shange, uh, thank you for your time, and the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Morgan. I would like to definitely extend my thanks to you for the invite and uh, also uh, thank Farm Foundation, USDA, ERS for having such a great conference here. Um, I do want to recognize the leadership that came before me uh, in this introductory panel. Um, I want to thank Dr. McLaren and Dr. Goldman for the work that they do um, as the work that we do that I'll present a little bit to here um, regarding the Center of Excellence. Uh, wouldn't be possible uh, without the work that they put in um, and allowing for the partnerships as well as for um, uh, the work with USDA to establish the center. Uh, so I'm going to uh, share my screen. So um, I do want to acknowledge first, so we are the Center for Farming Systems, Rural Prosperity and, and Economic Sustainability, as Dr. McLaren mentioned. Um, I do want to recognize the uh, the leadership team at Tuskegee University uh, and the founding director, Dr. Walter A. Hill, um, as well as the rest of the team members, Dr. Conrad Bonzi, Dr. Tasha Hargrove, Dr. Franklin Quarko, and uh, myself, which I am the co-director. The co um, so as, as stated, um, this center was initiated by the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, it was preceded by uh, what they call the, the, the anniversary or uh, legacy centers. Um, of which there was uh, six initial participants and in what was then the Center for Integrative uh, and Sustainable uh, Small Farms, Ranchers and Landowners Center. 
Um, that has expanded uh, as we established this new center uh, and includes all 19 institutions. Um, and originally we, we separated ourselves into four, uh, four sorry, uh, six thrust areas, um, of which there's farm commodities, processes, and systems, ranch commodities, processes, and systems, forest commodities, processes, and systems, value added technology and marketing, uh, the integrated environment, economic, and social impacts. Uh, these universities that you see to the right are new participants uh, in these uh, other areas. Uh, so as we started out the first few years, um, everyone pretty much uh, stayed in their individual thrust areas. Uh, but we, as we began to grow uh, and we began to see common areas of interest, other universities um, joined some of the other groups to take part in those programs. Um, so again, those, those are five thrust areas that we initiated with um, and actually began a lot of work. Um, well, actually work that had, was already there at the universities. Uh, one thing to understand too, uh, you, you can kind of in your mind's eye, see the map that Dr. McLaren had laid out. Those 19 institutions, I would say each and every one of them have a small farms program um, that already were, were working uh, with small farmers, uh, whether that be through research uh, extension or integrated research and extension. Uh, so it was our initial intent just to unify those small farm centers around these uh, five thrust areas. The initial goals of the center were to establish adaptive research, uh, technology assessment and development of practices, enhanced cloud of extension delivery and programming, uh, and increased educational opportunities for the future um, uh, farmers and agricultural specialists. Um, also, each 1890 will collaborate with US USDA and other private sector partners. And then lastly, uh, which we recently added um, in a continuation of the award was to emphasize rural prosperity and economic sustainability by introducing innovative technologies, entrepreneurship, uh, marketing, communication, broadband internet, and other collaborations. So I'm just gonna go through and quickly highlight some of the, the, uh, the areas um, in those goals. So our partners at Kentucky State University um, have been working uh, very, um, I would say, uh, effectively in the industrial hemp field. Um, they actually uh, sought to collaborate with four other 1890 institutions and run field trials on certain fiber varieties uh, of uh, hemp. Um, so in addition to its medicinal purposes, they also really push for growers uh, to have uh, interest in some of the grain and fiber uh, properties as well. Um, another, what I would say, collaborative effort uh, was done by our partners at Tennessee State University, led by uh, Dr. Jason DeKoff, uh, in which he completed a survey of all 18 of the states that we work in, as well as our partner institutions, the 1862s, um, a survey about sustainable agriculture and extension. So remember, one of the chief goals of, of the center was to enhance extension uh, programming in our, our entire region. Uh, so this was an in incredible effort at doing that. I, I would suggest that you visit the website uh, that Jason has uh, established, and it goes through all the results of that. And I think it would be really good for extension uh, professionals uh, to actually utilize this information and in implement sustainable ag practices in their programs. Uh, so some more of the programs, uh, our partners at West Virginia State University, um, they have had a program for years in cold chain management and at providing education to small farmers in cold chain management. Um, and in their programming, they was able to reach over 60 small limited resource farmers um, and have a fleet of 10 cool bot trailers, uh, which they rent out to local farms. Langston University uh, not only leads uh, this thrust area for ranchers, um, but they're also the lead for the small ruminant uh, consortium amongst the 1890 universities. Uh, and they were able to take their programming uh, web base where they've been able to reach uh, many more uh, small ruminant producers in the Southeastern region. Alcorn State University has uh, been doing and facilitating workshops and mushroom production for small farms um, uh, as this is a, a high-end um, uh, uh, product that a lot of our farmers can utilize uh, in some of their land that is not in production. 
And uh, one of my favorite uh, areas and goals that we have been uh, engaged in is increasing opportunities for the next generation of small farmers and agricultural specialists. Uh, we have graduate and undergraduate programs. Um, the uh, Alabama A&M student wildfire team, as well as the graduate students at these other universities came and presented at our annual professional agricultural workers conference this past year. Um, we continue to see more participation at the undergraduate level, um, as well as the development of actual internship programs. Um, one of which I would love to, to talk about here that's hosted uh, with us uh, at Tuskegee University. That's a partnership with uh, UC Davis and NFAS, um, in which there's a fellowship program for students particularly working in food systems. Um, this is a graduate program, um, and they are on their second cohort uh, right now uh, of scholars. Um, and we take participants from both um, 1890s as well as um, other historically uh, Black colleges and universities as well. And the last program is our internship program, and that's the Future Farmers and Agri-Food Specialists. Um, now has uh, three tracks, uh, one for high schoolers, one for undergraduates, and then a, a graduate um, extension traineeship as well. Um, and we'll see some of the outcomes of this uh, in a few seconds. Um, so just wanted to highlight a few of the partners uh, that we've had uh, across the entire region uh, that have helped on this work, um, as just do want to highlight um, Dr. McLaren's uh, relationship that we spoke of with Microsoft, uh, but Cargill, as well as W.K. Kellogg Foundation, has funded a lot of the work uh, that has been done through this center. One of the, one of the I would say, chief products that have come out of this work have been uh, State of African Americans in the Black Belt Report. Um, you can find them on the uh, CISC website. Um, that is the local center of excellence at Tuskegee. Um, is CISC1881.org. Uh, released the second report this past year. Um, and we were focused uh, this year on the Farm Bill and how those policies impact what we call the equity desert in the Black Belt South. Um, the first report, uh, I think, is, is a great read as well. Um, please visit the website uh, and, and please engage. Um, one other thing that I'm going to talk about before I go to our outcomes is uh, the Climate Economic Environmental Justice Academy uh, that was started in 2022. Um, it had over 40 participants that included extension professionals as well as community-based organizations. Uh, it was a partnership with the EPA, um, and our second cohort will begin uh, again in next year, uh, next fall. So we're looking forward uh, to the continuation of that as well. Um, but in speaking specifically to some of the um, some of the outputs as well as outcomes of the center, we've been able to reach over twenty six thousand uh, persons who've gained knowledge in the technologies, agricultural technologies that we've presented. Um, there's been uh, uh, 33 new initiatives to increase rural prosperity, uh, 28 to increase uh, enhance farming systems, and 26 uh, to enhance environmental sustainability. And a lot of these have come through other um, competitive grants uh, that have been awarded um, as the funding for the center provides uh, seed funding uh, that then leads to larger funding. Um, and one of the things that has come out and has been reported back by a lot of our participants are the Climate Smart Commodities uh, uh, Partnership Grants uh, through NRCS, of which the 1890s were awarded over $100 million, uh, much of that going directly to the producers. Um, so another great impact of this. Um, and then again, we have strength and capacities both in communities as well as on small farms. And with that, I would like to end there. And uh, I would like to thank um, uh, Dr. Morgan for the time. Um, and uh, and yield the rest of my time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Shange, for those remarks and for highlighting the important work and the diverse work um, of, of your center of excellence. Um, so with that, uh, I just want to extend again our, our thanks to all three of the speakers. Um, I know we're not there in person, but uh, I know virtually we're all very grateful for your time uh, and for your remarks. Um, so with that, this will wrap up our opening session. Uh, we will now transition to our first research session, 
uh, which is going to focus on diversity and participation in US government programs. Um, you can join this session at the top of the hour using the event hub of the conference website, as Martha explained earlier.